We accidentally built the lunar module a little too small. Why don't you just send a chimpanzee? Three, two, one, takeoff. Apollo 10 and a half spins a tale of nostalgia and has us all longing for the days of innocence and fantasy that comes with being a child. But beyond the surface, the film has quite a few Easter eggs and hidden tidbits that make the film even more interesting and that you might have missed when watching. I was just wondering why it couldn't be an astronaut or something actually cool. Number one, the meaning behind the name. While much of Apollo 10 and a half takes place in the imagination of a young boy, there are still some nods to real life events and people that connected the audience with the reality of the actual Apollo takeoff. When Stan is approached by the two NASA officials to start his flight training, they're named Bostick and Kranz, after actual NASA engineers Jerry Bostick and Gene Kranz. It also just so happens that Jack Black, who voices the older version of Stan, has a connection to Apollo 13 as well. My mom worked on the Apollo 13 abort guidance system. His mother was part of the team who helped develop the abort guidance system, which is a backup computer system that would have helped in case they needed to abort the mission. A neighbor behind us worked on the helmets. A girl in my class's mom helped make the suits. It was like everyone was doing something for NASA one way or another. Number two, what happened to the sugar? Who didn't love Frosted Flakes as a kid? Heck, who doesn't love them as an adult? Well, turns out that people have been loving the sugary cereal since the 1960s. Right before Stan's father announces he has free tickets to an epic amusement park in Houston, we see that the children are enjoying Frosted Flakes for breakfast. But there's a catch. Back in 1969, Frosted Flakes were called Sugar Frosted Flakes. Either Apollo 10 and a half made a continuity mistake, or they wanted to show the realism behind the memory of a human. Number three, first or last name. There was also another continuity error to catch in Apollo 10 and a half, but it seems like this one was definitely done on purpose. In real life, Apollo astronauts wear name tags with their last name written on them. And while that is consistent with what we see in the film, when Stan relays his tale about being an Apollo astronaut, his name tag has his first name on it instead. Number four, is it product placement if it's been out of production for 50 years? We can clearly see the Admiral branding on Stan's family TV. What some younger folks watching this movie might not know is that Admiral was an actual company and is nowadays known as AOC. The family car was made by Oldsmobile, a long-lasting company that shut down in 2004. We can also see a Hitachi radio and an SO gas station. What other brands did you spot? Number 5. Recognizable Old Films Much like now, a common pastime back in the 1960s was to watch films. Stanley's family takes a visit to the drive-in, at a discounted price, by hiding some of their older children, of course. During the trip, the movie pays tribute to multiple famous films that everyone recognizes. We see animated clips and title screens from films like The Shakiest Gun in the West and Hellfighters, both from 1968, and Swiss Family Robinson from 1960. It was always fun to just roam around. We'd go looking for couples making out in their cars. Number 6. They Watched the Classics Apart from the drive-in, Stan's family also enjoys a good movie theater date, and, you guessed it, other famous films that aired in 1969 were given a shout-out. We see excerpts of films like It, The Frozen Dead, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Countdown. Did you notice any other popular films on the theater screen? Number 7. Stan Loved Television We've covered movies seen in drive-ins and theaters, so it's only right that the Apollo 10 and a half creators would also want to pay tribute to famous television series as well. Stan's family is seen in front of their TV screen multiple times in the film. Whether it's to watch the Apollo launch, the news, or a good sitcom, it's definitely portrayed as the center of their home. We get a sneak peek of series and movies like I Love Lucy, Leave It to Beaver, The Dick Van Dyke Show, The Addams Family, Gilligan's Island, Mission Impossible, the list is endless. What makes these even more interesting is we get to see animated versions of these live-action classics. Number 8. Introducing His Family Speaking of old TV shows, Stan makes reference to a pretty famous sitcom that made waves in the 1960s when he's introducing his family. I was the last of six in our own Brady Bunch configuration of the family. The Brady Bunch first aired in 1969 and was a comedy about a widowed father marrying a single mother and raising their six children together in one house. See, I hear you're not in any of these. You were adopted. Har har, very funny. Number 9. A Love Letter to Texas in a red carpet interview, producer Mike Blizzard called Apollo 10 and a half the most Houston film ever made, and he has good reason to have that opinion. Throughout the film, we get to see some major Houston staples that anyone who lives in the area would appreciate to the fullest. 
Stan and his family take a trip to the amusement park Astro World, and not the Travis Scott Astro World you may be thinking of, which is across from another attraction, Astro Dome. We also get to see Stan take a vacation to Galveston Beach. Who's up for some Astro World? Yeah. Number 10. We still shop at them. When you watch the film, you might have picked up on some stores and establishments that are still around today. And unlike the Houston Staples, these are recognizable to a lot of people across North America. There's a scene where we get to see Stan pick up some ice cream with his brothers from the 1960s version of the dessert chain Baskin Robbins. When the family is parking outside the movie theater, we also get a glimpse of storefronts belonging to AMC Music and the tax company H&R Block. Number 11. A too recent addition. Before we get to see Stan launch, we get a shot of him holding up and reading Mad Magazine. The magazine says it's the July 1969 edition, and while people will question the continuity of how he could be reading the July edition, it was common even back then for magazines to release editions months in advance. Mad Magazine is still around today. Number 12. They got the label confused. There's been no word on whether this next detail was a mistake or if it was a creative decision by the creators. But at one point we see Stan's sister Jana put on the Monkey's debut album. The record reads that it was released by the Sundays label, however that version was actually released in 1996. The original 1967 album was released under the Colgams label. What do you think? Was it done on purpose or was it a mistake? Number 13. They were old friends. While this was Jack Black and Zachary Levi's first team-up, there's a reason why Glenn Powell ended up as part of the cast for this film. He and creator Richard Linklater had previously worked together. The two were a part of the 2016 movie Everybody Wants Some. While there hasn't been confirmation on whether he auditioned or was recommended for the role, the two being familiar with one another definitely came in handy when creating such a complex film. This is a covert operation. That means it does not exist. You get it? This meeting? This never happened. Number 14. An animated throwback. Just like he gave a little shout out to the Brady Bunch, Stan also made reference to the show Duck and Cover. Not only was it shown playing on the family's television set, but Jack Black narrates by saying he was the last of the Duck and Cover generation. Duck and Cover was an instructional video on how families could protect themselves if there was ever a nuclear explosion. Instead of cartoons, this is what a lot of children watched in school so they'd know how to react. Number 15. Another Houston staple. There's one last Houston staple that snuck its way into the film. We get to catch a glimpse of the famous Whataburger fast food restaurant chain based in San Antonio in Texas. The first restaurant was opened in Texas back in 1950. Think in and out but Houston. What did you love about Netflix's Apollo 10 and a half? Were you shocked at any of the hidden details? Do you know a detail we missed? Let us know in the comments section below and if you like this video make sure you give it a big thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching.